Hey, Super Mario Brothers, happy 35th anniversary. How's that make you feel? Probably pretty old if I'm anything to go by, who also celebrated their 35th anniversary earlier this year. So what's up everyone, Andre here to talk about Super Mario Bros. because today, as I kind of alluded to, is in fact its 35th anniversary in Japan. It came out September 13th, 1985 in Japan, and as it turns out, it is now September 13th in that same place. So, as part of the celebration, they have done something that I don't think they've ever done before, and that's that they've launched classic websites for uh, for Super Mario Brothers as well as Super Mario Brothers 2. And I believe this is the first time that uh, any Famicom game has gotten its own official website, which is a pretty fun way to celebrate the occasion. Kind of makes it feel even more impactful, more important. It kind of gives you an idea of how they you know, may have talked about these games. Um, had the web been around back in 1985. So, yeah, uh, to celebrate, I thought we'd just take a look at these websites, talk about some of my memories with the games, talk about some things about the artwork and everything in general, and, uh, yeah, just go over just whatever comes to mind. So, with that, let's get to it, and right away you might notice that, of course, the website's in Japanese, so let's go ahead and see if we can get some kind of English translation in here. We probably won't use it too much, but, you know, in case we need it, there we go. So, first things first is we get this amazing classic artwork, which I believe was the box art and cartridge art for Super Mario Brothers back in the day in Japan. Now this wasn't the box art or I don't think it was even used in any of the materials you could actually buy in the United States at least, uh, but there was definitely merchandise that you could see this artwork on it. I myself had a kite with this exact uh, art on it and um, I don't know where that kite went to. I don't think I ever flew it but I was afraid of damaging it. I just held, I just put it on my wall as if it were like a poster or something. So one of the key things here, as you probably noticed, is it offers an early look at how these characters may have looked uh, or, you know, were portrayed to look back in the day. And while some things are recognizable and some others are actually pretty faithful to how they are these days, a few others have changed quite a bit. So I figured we'd just go over a couple of them here. And right away we have Mario, who is obviously recognizable, but he's a little bit heavier back then, um, so I guess he lost some weight from rescuing the princess, you know, 500 times in the year since. Uh, and also, um, his color scheme for his shirt and pants and, and overalls has swapped. So whereas it used to be a blue shirt and red pants, it is now these days uh, a red shirt with blue overalls. So it's fun that they provided these uh, more uh, more modern appearances of the characters for an easy contrast here. Now another thing to notice is I think some of the other artwork on this page is also classic. Uh, but you're gonna notice that there isn't always a consistency with it. Um, I forget if they were all from the exact time frame or not, but they were definitely a lot looser in their style guide back then than they are these days. So you wouldn't see this wide of interpretation um, for these characters unless, you know, it was by design, so to speak. So, uh, beyond that, Mario's holding a mushroom, which looks a little bit different than how they do these days. This one's got an easy, basically a handle, which makes it handy. Although, interesting that Mario can hold it without or I guess he has to hold it to maintain the super form. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> we have a Goomba that looks almost exactly as they do these days. Uh, the other characters look, you know, similar but different. We have an early version of Lakitu. The Hammer Brother looks a little different, a little bit, I don't know, beefier, I suppose. The Koopa Troopa has an amazing face. I like the blooper waving here. Now, it's this crew over here that's probably the most interesting. First of all, we have the Toads, and I love how they still have their their, their vests that they wear um, with nothing underneath and their, like, diaper-looking pants things. But interestingly, they all seem to have, like, these outer belly buttons. So it's nice to see that that kind of represent representation finally make its way to games. Uh, then we have Peach or Princess Toadstool, as she was known then. And again, looking quite a bit different to not just how she appears in the game, but to her modern day appearance as well. Um, she looks a little bit shorter, almost like a kid. I don't think that's what they were going for, but she definitely looks pretty young for a princess or a ruler. Um, and yeah, just interesting to see how that's evolved. Again, compared to her, you know, her more modern day appearance right here. Um, she almost looks, she looks smaller than Mario, and that might just be a matter of perspective. But yeah, that's something that they've definitely ironed out over the years. And then we have Bowser himself, who, for whatever reason, reminds me of Biff from the Back to the Future series. It's probably the blonde mane, but yeah, I don't fully know what's going on there, but he's got like the blue, he's got blue skin, he's got these really pronounced uh, spikes, and yeah, he just looks kind of like, like a jerk, right? Like he's, he's menacing, and I wouldn't say he's necessarily less menacing looking these days, but he just looks like, he just looks like he's a massive jerk in this picture. So that's, I think, why I get the, the Biff vibes from this. 
Anyway, so that's the art. Let's go and scroll down here past uh, what, uh, you know, the more modern art. Um, we get a look at a bit of a story here. There's a little bit more coming up in a sec. We have some pictures from the game. Um, gotta love that classic 8-bit art style. You know, it's still... I don't know if necessarily... I don't know if I want to say it holds up necessarily, but it's, it's such an ingrained part of our gaming society now that it just does by default, right? Like, it just works. <laughs> um... We can see, I, I don't remember if these are truly the classic art from the era. Uh, I think they are, but I can't be for sure. So I don't know if these were in the instruction manual or what. It definitely looks more refined than what we see in the artwork above. But again, that might be due to uh, just artistic, different artistic interpretations. Um, scrolling down, we get uh, the proper story, or introduction as they call it here, with a clan of the great Turtle Koopa, Bowser, who manipulates powerful magic invading the, uh, the peaceful kingdom where the mushrooms live. Now here's something interesting. All the gentle mushroom clans uh, were transformed into rocks, bricks, horsetails, etc. by their magic, uh, I guess by Bowser's magic, or King Koopa's magic, how he's known in Japan. That's right, it's not Bowser in Japan, it's King Koopa. So yeah, this is something interesting, because I think if you've, I mean, you've probably heard over the years that the bricks in the Mario games um, are in fact, according to the original instruction manual, are, uh, were transformed toads. So every time you're breaking a brick, supposedly that's a toad being destroyed. Maybe that's why mushrooms pop out, right? It's a little bit dark. But, uh, I wasn't sure that was just a localization thing, but apparently, no, this seems to be canon based on the Japanese website. And they go a step farther, clarifying that also rocks, uh, rocks, bricks, and horsetails are all included in that. So yeah, that's, that's a lot. So those poor, poor toads. Um, so yeah, it goes in a little bit more into the story, how you have to rescue Princess Peach. Since we can't read all the text, I'm not going to read it verbatim. Um, I love the profile view of the Goomba, which is something you don't too often see. Uh, which, and because, especially in the game, like, there's no depth to its face, but in the profile view, we can see that, at least in this interpretation of it, yeah, he's got, like, a fairly pronounced, like, nose section or mouth section. Uh, we have profile views of Mario and then Toad reaching out for the Goomba for some reason. <laughs> um, look at, look at all the scrolling, uh, screenshots from the game. It's, uh, just, it brings back so many memories of playing this game. Not quite 35 years ago. I didn't play it right as soon as I popped out, but, uh, you know, 30 to 33 years ago. So, yeah, fun to see this. Um, here we have uh, just a rundown of the characters again. Um, it, it looks like Bowser is being referred to as, as the leader of the Turtle Clan. Again, he's King Koopa here, uh, if I remember correctly. Not Bowser. You gotta love his classic sprite, though, which looks, looks a little bit different to, you know, to anything we've seen since. No other Bowser's come close to that, except for maybe, I would say, Super Mario World's Bowser, which is probably the closest official version uh, we've had to the original. But what's interesting is that uh, Sakurai, when making Super Smash Bros. Me Melee and introducing Giga Bowser, that was it. That was based on how he viewed Bowser originally. Um, he felt that Bowser looked more imposing in the original game, and he wanted a Bowser in Smash Bros. that reflected how he perceived Bowser as looking based on the sprite work. So that's Giga Bowser. That's pretty fun. Um, then we have you know Peach again with uh, or Toadstool with red hair in the game, although it's not you know as far as I'm aware, it's not red in, or it hasn't been red in, in, in any of the artwork we've seen so far. I believe there is some art out there from the original game that has her with red hair. I could be misremembering, so don't quote me on that. Um, here we get some classic, uh, like, zoomed-in sprites from the original, and I just love this. Like, look at the Goomba or the Koopa Troopa. It's like giant gap in its mouth. I don't know. Uh, we have some pictures which I believe are almost straight from the instruction manual. I'm pretty sure I remember seeing these in the English instruction manual. And we can see, like, Small Mario and how you this is how you begin at the start of the game. And if you get hit, well, that's game over. We have the mushroom getting, you know, making Mario bigger. He's throwing a fireball here. And <laughs> it looks like he's barely even trying. It's like, oof! It's just like a little toss of a fireball. And then we have Invincible Mario. So, again, you can see the inconsistency in the, in the artwork and just how much we've come since then. And I think it might be because they're trying to make the artwork look a little bit more like the sprite work officially. So it's interesting to see that. Um, here we have some more pictures again that I remember from the instruction book with Mario hitting a block underneath, taking out Koopa Troopa. Again, that block is presumably a toad. Uh, taking out a bunch of Koopa Troopas with, uh, by kicking a shell through them and bouncing on a bunch of Goombas. I love this, like, again, like the classic look for these games and showing like the, you know, the, the animation trying to portray like what the game 
how it looks in game. It's pretty difficult to do this. Hop on three enemies in a row, so and uh, you only get 400 points for that. What? Um, and it says uh, it looks like you get one more Mario as well as points if you. I think it was. Uh, I, does it say here? I think it was seven enemies before, even in the original, but I'm not sure entirely. Scrolling down, it gives us a rundown of the worlds. Um, you know, World 1-1, one, one, one one, World 1-2, one um, I think 1-3, 1-4, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, I could be misremembering. It's been a little while since I've played Super Mario Brothers. Although I just did revisit it briefly in Mario All-Stars recently. And then, of course, we have, it wraps up with the Game & Watch. Uh, that's coming out soon that has Super Mario Brothers and Super Mario Brothers 2 again being the lost levels in uh, outside Japan so let's go ahead and flip over to that website and let's take a look at that oh Mario runs to the warp pipe I love that <laughs> and it's taking us to Super Mario Brothers 2 all right so um, I love just the scrolling images here now this game is so interesting because in the States I, if, if I remember like at the age that I got the Lost Levels, like, this was 1994, I believe, um, I don't think, like, it wasn't commonly known that there was a different version of Mario 2 in Japan, that there was a true, proper sequel to the original game, while almost looking identical to the original game, only with a few gameplay tweaks, so finding out about the Lost Levels, like, kind of blew my mind, I'm sure it blew a lot of young kids' minds, so it was fun to finally revisit them, almost like a ROM hack in Mario All-Stars, uh, so I don't know if I've actually played the original version of this game, the un -all the non-All-Stars version, all the way through. I guess if you count the deluxe version of Mario Brothers on the Game Boy Color, I did, because they included that as well. I think it did call it Super Mario Brothers 2 then, or maybe it was still Lost Levels, but it had a classic appearance, so I may have, I'm pretty sure I did beat that one, actually. Alright, let's go ahead and scroll down, and it gives us a rundown of what this game's all about. It's got higher difficulty than the previous game. Um, while maintaining the same basic structure and graphics, it also incorporates nasty gimmicks such as uh, damage when take, uh, such as um, I'm not quite sure what's saying there. Oh, mushrooms, such as like poison mushrooms that damage you when taken, and tailwinds are swept away uh, by the body. So we get the basic idea. There's strong gusts of wind in the game, and those suck. And uh, those poison mushrooms too, like it's just making an enemy out power ups. How evil is that? Uh, so yeah, we can see how they modified some of the texture work or some of the sprite work in the game. Um, which is fun to see, and yeah, so there are a total of 52 courses, including those that can be played if the, if the conditions are, I'm assuming, right. Um, so 1.5 times as many courses in the previous game are waiting for you. So yeah, the big thing about this game is when you beat it, you're not done. If you did it right, you can access a whole additional realm of worlds to play, and those are even more difficult. Um, I believe in All-Stars, they were known as like worlds A, B, C, and D. There may, maybe there was even more than that. Um, I don't know how they were known in the original game. But yeah, so this is a tough, tough game. <laughs> um, which is why actually they didn't release it in, um, in America at all. They thought it was too difficult for US gamers. Um, and so that's why they modified, or partially why they modified, uh, Doki Doki Panic into what would be our Super Mario Brothers 2. So yeah, it's just weird to see this. And to see, I mean, both sequels are weird in their own ways, like looking back. I guess at the time, the Super Mario Brothers 2 felt less weird because it looks like the original. But looking back now, where every Mario game pretty much looks entirely different from the one before and after it, it's weird to see such a direct sequel back then. But then you look at our Super Mario Brothers 2, and that game's pretty darn different to the original game, right? It's got running and jumping common, but almost everything else is different. Uh, including the fact, you know, including the very fact that it's in a dream world, which is, I guess, how they work around the differences. So, yeah, it's kind of fun to see that, but I guess, you know, things were far less, you know, um, set in stone back then in the game industry, and uh, to my memory, it seemed, it didn't seem as out of place back then as it does now, so it's so weird to look at these two games and how time has kind of changed the context, and how the weird one seems more normal, and, uh, the normal one, being this one, seems weirder. Anyways, continuing on. Um, instead of playing two people alternatively for the previous work, you can choose to play either Mario or Luigi. Luigi has a higher jump than Mario and is slippery. So yeah, that's a big thing in this game. Uh, basically the first time you could play as Luigi in a single player game. Um, you could play as him also in Mario Brothers, but I believe that was only in two player mode. And yeah, he had different, hand different handling. So this is where, this has now been a thing for 35 years. Not entirely consistent, but they have, it's something they have brought back now, such as in, I think, Mario Galaxy, where Luigi is, jumps higher, is slipperier, and is, uh, slippier, and, slippier? Sl slipperier, <laughs> there we go. There's no slippy in this game. And, um... And yeah, it, it, in some ways it's easier, and in some ways it's more difficult. You get more air time that comes at the expense of handling, because you're slipping around on the ground. So, yeah. Uh, I love this dead blooper art. 
Not because it's dead, I just like the art, <laughs> to be clear. Um, we can see, uh, let's go in and read this. The basic system remains the same. New gimmicks such as poisonous mushrooms are damaged when taken, and tailwinds are swept away. Okay, this is the same thing I read earlier. So we get to see the wind in effect with the, um, the leaves showing the wind direction and the strength of it. There's a poison mushroom, which I love the appearance of in Lost Wor Lost Levels, by the way. How it has, like, the, I think basically the skull and crossbones on there, the poison, you know, basically showing that's poison. Um, I remember the artwork for that game. I remember the Nintendo Power for Super Mario All-Stars showing Mario running away from a poison mushroom. I'm like, man, that looks fun. Little did I know how difficult that game was. <laughs> and then we have, uh, like, combining these crazy springs of junk that launches super high with the wind. Things get crazy with how they layer things on top of each other. Uh, more classic instructions with, I don't know, uh, Mario's jump height uh, being the same, apparently. Mario running across gaps that are one wide. And, uh jumping across enemies to, you know, to to cross gaps. And I guess that's something that's more pronounced in this game than it was in the, in the original. So yeah, that's another way that they make it even more difficult uh, than it used to be. And yeah, that looks like it. Um, you know, that's, they're taking us to the Game of Watch site here, which I'm pretty excited for. Look at this, look at that sleek baby. Um, even if it has nothing in common with the <laughs> original Game of Watches in the gameplay sense, minus this Game of Ball, Although it is interesting that they're including... So, real quick, so just to reiterate, this Game of Watch includes Mario, Super Mario Brothers, Super Mario Brothers 2, The Lost Levels, as well as um, this ball version of Mario, which is the original Game & Watch, along with uh, a clock, as you may have saw, that also has, I think, 35 Easter eggs, which is really neat. Um, so yeah, this is a fun little thing, but one thing they're kind of missing is that there was a Super Mario Bros. There was a Super Mario Brothers version of a Game & Watch. It wasn't particularly great, but I'm surprised that it's not here, because that seems like that'd be a perfect fit for a Super Mario Brothers celebration. So I'm not quite sure why they included Ball versus the Super Mario Brothers Game & Watch, but hey, there you go. So yeah, anyway, everyone, this this website's not anything new, so we're not going to say anything about it. But it is, uh, yeah, that's just our look at these um, classic these classic websites celebrating Super Mario Brothers 35th anniversary. Like this game, this game's importance in the history of gaming like really can't be overstated. Like it's such a monumental game and it's still, the fact that it's still fun to play today speaks so much to how well designed it is. Now I would say it hasn't aged perfect, perfectly. The fact that you can't scroll back to the left, the fact that there's like really no save system, you know, things of that nature, and even some gameplay elements, you know, are possibly questionable. But by and large, the game is still really, you know, still really enjoyable to play, and that speaks volumes to it. Like, I remember growing up with this game and just expanding my mind as to what games could be. Um, and that really just is an amazing thing. So happy anniversary, Super Mario Brothers. Um, happy 35th. That's just wild that you're that old as myself. <laughs> and yeah, so that's about it. That's all I have to say on the matter. Let us know in the comments below what you think about anything related to this. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. And we will catch you later as we cover even more Mario's 35th anniversary coming up for the following weeks, months, and uh, I was going to say years, but that wouldn't really make sense, would it? <laughs> all right, guys, we'll catch you later. Bye, everyone.